Good evening. Thanks for joining us on this last night of our gospel meeting this week. It's been a good week. I'll have a few closing comments after the uh, final. They definitely aren't the answer. So you cross those out. And then hopefully you narrow it down to the best uh, one or two things that it possibly could be. That's really what we're going to do today. We want to, by process of elimination, try to come to a conclusion about who Jesus is by seeing that there are some ideas out there about him that just can't be true. And the first one that just can't be true is the idea that Jesus was a legend. Jesus was a myth. Jesus is fiction. I want to tell you that just isn't true. F.F. F. Bruce is a professor of biblical criticism and he says this, some writers may toy with the fancy of a Christ myth, but they do not do so on the ground of historical evidence. The historicity of Christ is as axiomatic for the unbiased historian as the historicity of Julius Caesar. It is not historians who propagate the Christ myth theories. There's a great book um, called The Historical Jesus it's by Gary Habermas, who's a professor at Liberty University, I believe. He's done a lot of work on the resurrection of Jesus, some really good research um, about the authenticity of the Gospels and, and about the record about Jesus. But he says this in his book, The Historical Jesus, he says, surprisingly, few scholars have asserted that Jesus never existed or have attempted to cast total doubt on his life and ministry. When such efforts have occurred, they have been met by rare outcries from the scholarly community. And we have seen that these attempts are refuted almost every turn by the early and eyewitness testimony presented by Paul and others, as well as the early date of the Gospels. His book details a lot of the things I'm going to mention to you in a really brief amount of time here in just a moment. But what I'm going to show you is just going to indicate that historians, and these quotes indicate, historians cannot rightfully place Jesus in the realm of a legend or myth. Jesus doesn't fit in the same category as mythological gods like Zeus or Apollo or Athena. He's not some unprovable legend like Bigfoot or the abominable snowman. He doesn't fit into the fiction section of the library or comic book store like Superman or Batman or Iron Man or Aquaman. He's not like that. Historically, these people we know are made up. They're just comic book characters. Historically, they're just costumes that people put on to pretend to be something. But historically, Jesus was a real person from a real place living during a real time. Luke makes that very clear in his gospel. And so we're going to start with the inspired record. But Luke, in Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, he documents some things about Jesus that makes Jesus as historical as he possibly could be. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, one of the things that he documents is the name of the emperor who was reigning during the time of the birth of Jesus. It says in Luke 2, 1, it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Who was in power when you were born? Who was the president when you were born? You know, just like we believe the president is real, we believe that you are real. Just like we believe Caesar Augustus was a real emperor. We study about him in history class. We also believe that Jesus was real. A real person who was born during a real time when a real Roman emperor was reigning. But we see other things in the Gospel of Luke. Like in Luke chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Look, you can still take tours of Israel today. It's getting a little scary with some of the stuff going on in Iran right now, but you can still take tours, and they're still taking tours to Israel today. And you can still go to these cities and these places, and you can see that these are real places. You don't have the money to go to Israel, which I haven't had the money to go to Israel yet and take a tour, but you can get on YouTube. You can follow Apian Media, um, who have done great video work as they've gone to Israel, and you can watch some of those videos where they document the places that Jesus was and where he was raised. And they go to Bethlehem, and they show it to you with great footage. But these are real places, Bethlehem. It says that he was of the house and lineage of David. So he's from a real family. 
He is registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who is with child. And it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped it in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. What this chapter documents for us is that there's a current Roman emperor. There's a hometown of Jesus that's also mentioned in Acts 2.22. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. Peter preaches. Jesus of Nazareth. He's from a real city, a real town. And he's got a real birthplace. Now, based on the evidence, there's no good reason from the inspired history to doubt the historicity of Jesus Christ. They do everything that your birth certificate does. It gives you your name, it gives you where you were born, in the hospital you were born, um, and it puts you in a real state. Okay, It does everything that your birth certificate does. Additionally, I would say there's strong institutional evidence to believe in Jesus Christ. Now here's what I mean by that. Why do we have Ford cars? Because at one point in time there was somebody named Henry Ford who started the Ford Motor Company. Why do we have Bell Telephone? And maybe we're not as familiar with Bell Telephone these days as a lot of the other companies, but we wouldn't have Bell Telephone if it weren't for Alexander Graham Bell. Christianity and the Church of Christ would not have its long-standing existence if it were not for the fact that Jesus Christ has existed at one point in time. Now, there's more evidence beyond just inspired history. Some say, oh, well, you're using the Bible to prove the Bible. Look, there's other evidence outside of the Bible that proves the historicity of Jesus. I mean, yes, we should be able to use the Bible, um, just like we should be able to use your mom and dad and your friends to prove, you know, who you are. Um, so we can use the Bible and we can see that Luke documents it. And we can read the book of Romans and 1 Corinthians and we can read about... Um, you know, Paul affirming the death and resurrection of Jesus. We can read about Peter affirming that Christ suffered once for our sins. And we can see that in 1 Peter, which was written around 63 AD. We can find John affirming the fleshly existence of Jesus Christ in his gospel, which was written in the 80s or 90s AD. In fact, all 27 books of the New Testament, they, they proclaim, verify, they often assume the historicity of Jesus Christ. But there's other evidence as well. And if you want other evidence, and if you want to read about other evidence, there's some good books that you can look at. For one, there's one that I've got right here, The Case for Christ, that Lee Strobel wrote. Read some chapters in it where they're going to take a chapter or two to try to explain why you can believe the historicity of Jesus Christ. But some of the things you're going to find in The Case for Christ and, and books like it is there was a man named Thallus in 52 AD. He writes about Jesus Christ. There was a man named Suetonius who was a court official under the Roman Emperor Hadrian. And in set, in, in Hadrian ruled from 70 to 130 AD. Um, he writes about Jesus Christ. Cornelius Tacitus was a secular writer. These are people who aren't believers in Jesus as the Son of God, but they don't deny the fact that he was a historical character. They speak of him when you read their writings in a condescending tone sometimes with suspicion, but they don't deny his historicity. Marabar Serapion, he lives in 73 AD, writes about Jesus in 73 AD. And there's even Jewish writers. Do Jews believe in Jesus? No. They don't believe that he was the son of God, but there are Jewish writers such as the Talmuds, which were written in the first and second century AD, that document and speak of Jesus. Josephus writes in the late 70s AD, and he mentions Jesus in his works. And then there's post-apostolic writers, people who lived after the apostles died, who were the disciples of the apostles, like Clement of Rome and Ignatius and, and others, um, like Justin Martyr. They write of Jesus, and these are people who are just a generation after Jesus Christ. There's a lot of evidence that Jesus was a historical character. And so, as we go through our multiple choice question here, and we ask, who's Jesus? Well, is he a historical myth? I just don't think that if we're, if we're, if we're leveling, leveling the playing field and we're treating Jesus like we would any other historical character, I don't think that we can say Jesus is a historical myth. If you can't believe that Jesus was a real character, you can't believe in Julius Caesar. 
there is more evidence for Jesus Christ than there is for even some of the Roman emperors um, in terms of the abundance of evidence we have. Well, let's look at option two. And that is, well, some people say that he was just a prophet. He was just a prophet. That's what the Muslims believe. Now, was Jesus a prophet? Yes, he was a prophet. He could predict things that were going to occur in the future. He does so in Matthew 24, Luke 21, as he predicts the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which occurred after his death, burial, and resurrection. In Acts chapter 3, it talks about, and, and it, it's cited here by Peter in the Gospel of in, in, in Luke. In, it's not in Luke. It's in Acts that Luke wrote. Um, it says here that, that God is going to raise up, verse 22, a prophet like me. Now the reference there is a reference to Moses, who was a prophet. And Moses once wrote that there is going to be another prophet who is going to be raised up. And we're told in this passage that that prophet that God was going to raise up was Jesus Christ. So Jesus was a prophet, but the question we want to ask is, was he just a prophet? Was he just a prophet? He claimed, and others reported his identity as greater than a mere prophet. So we need to be very clear about this, that Jesus never claimed to be just a prophet. Jesus claims to be the Messiah, and the Messiah is the anointed one of God. He claimed God as his father. In John chapter 5, he claims that God is his father, and that's why some of the Jews pick up stones to throw at him, because for Jesus to claim God was his father was for him to claim that he was deity. And they understood the implications of that claim. He called himself the I am in John 8, 58 and 59, which is a phrase that's used in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14 that's ascribed to God, I am, not I was, not I will be, I am, as in present tense, as in I'm eternal and I always exist. He claimed that that's who he was. Not only did he claim that for himself, he never claims to be just a prophet, other people testified, multiple people in Scripture testified that Jesus was more than a prophet. John the Baptizer does in John chapter 1 and verse 34. This is what John the Baptizer says, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. John the Baptizer didn't believe Jesus was just a prophet. God himself, in Matthew chapter 3 verse 16, when Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptizer, it says, Jesus came up immediately from the water. The heavens were opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, What did God say from the heavens? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He didn't say, This is a really good prophet. You should listen to him. This is my Son. This is family in whom I am well pleased. In the transfiguration, he would say, Hear ye him. Listen to him. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, John declares, In the beginning was the Word, at creation was the Word. Who's the Word? The Word was with God. So there's multiple people in this Godhead. And the Word was God. Who's the Word? The Word that became flesh, we're told later in John chapter 1, is Jesus. He was deity. Nathaniel answered in John chapter 1, 49, Rabbi, after Jesus prophesy something miraculously about Nathanael. Tell something that Nathanael realizes. You could only have known that miraculously. Nathanael says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Not just you're a prophet. You are the son of God. And Jesus doesn't say, no, 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 don't call me that. Jesus never rebukes anybody for calling him that. He takes that claim because Nathanael understood, understood properly who Jesus was. In Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Indeed, you're right. Um, as you continue through that context. And in John eleven twenty seven, 27, she said to him, and this is Martha and Mary having a conversation with Jesus at the, res the raising of Lazarus, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, 
Son of God, even he who comes into the world. And then one more, Mark 15 and verse 39, when the centurion, the one who is the Roman, who pierces Jesus in the side, the centurion, standing right in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was the Son of God. He's even, as a Gentile, impressed by Jesus and declares that he must have been the Son of God. Now, Jesus claims he's more than a prophet. He's the Son of God. Multiple people claim Jesus is not just a prophet. He's the Son of God. But here's the other reason why I think it's important for us to understand this claim about Jesus. Do you realize in the Old Testament, there was a test that was to be used in the book of Deuteronomy, and it was a test that was to determine, uh, at least in one way, you could know someone was a true prophet or a false prophet. One of the tests of a prophet was that a prophet had to have a 100% truthful message. If any of a prophet's message was false, the prophet was not to be trusted. That's what Deuteronomy 18.21 says. It says, if you say in your heart, how shall we know that the word which the Lord has not spoken? In other words, how do we know if when someone claims to be a prophet, how do we know whether they're telling the truth or not? It says, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So, here's the thing. If Jesus was a prophet at all, then all of his claims must be true, or he is not to be trusted. And Jesus claimed those who say he was a prophet. He claimed to be more than a prophet. He claimed to be the Son of God. So if he's a prophet at all, then he must be the Son of God, because that's what he claimed to be. Or else you really don't believe he was a prophet either. Um, all right, so was Jesus just a prophet? Uh, hopefully we've ruled that out. He claims to be more. Other people claim that he's more. And so I don't think Whatever it is that we believe about Jesus, I don't think that we can say that he was just a prophet. Because how can you be just a prophet and then say things that are false? That's not a real prophet. Well, what about this one? What about this idea that Jesus was a good philosopher? That he was just a good man? He, he taught some good morals, some good ethics. Um, as we think about this particular argument, I want you to consider this. This is, of course, the argument of Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson had a, a high regard for the ideals of Jesus, but he just didn't believe in his miracles. He just didn't think that was possible. And as you consider that, um, I want you to, to think about this. Many historians, if you were to go to any public university, to, to any, any public university today and study history, you automatically are going to study history with an anti-supernatural presupposition. That's how historians enter into their study of history. Now, what do I mean by anti-supernatural presupposition? I'll illustrate it this way. There are some people today who still do not believe Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Maybe there's people out there right now you don't believe that. That's fine. You can show them pictures, moon dust, you can let them talk to witnesses, and they still just don't believe it. They, they, they have an anti-moon walking presupposition. And you know, maybe you're right. I don't, I don't think our salvation depends on that. So we, we can disagree there. But there are also some people who cannot fathom the supernatural. They've never seen a miracle, and therefore they just cannot believe in the miracles of Jesus. It doesn't matter if the Bible says it. It doesn't matter if eyewitnesses record it. They automatically reject any supernatural reference as false history. But you know what? There's a bit of a problem. Just because we can't witness it today, does that mean it couldn't have happened in the past? I mean, just because I can't personally walk on the moon, does that mean nobody did? I think it's possible. 
Just because I've never been on the continent of Africa, does that mean that there aren't people on the continent of Africa? I've never been there, but I'm, I'm told there's people there. I think there's pretty good evidence of it. And, 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 and just because something is not happening now, does that mean it cannot happen in the future? Just because you know, my kids can't see me run as fast as I once did, and they can't see me jump up and grab a basketball rim anymore like I could when I was in high school, does that mean it never happened? It, I'm telling you, it happened. But it's not going to happen today. It won't happen. It doesn't happen today. That doesn't mean it couldn't have happened. Let's think, too, about the eyewitnesses who recorded the miracles concerning Jesus. Every one of them was persecuted. They all died for teaching about Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus really didn't perform those miracles, he really wasn't resurrected, don't you think that human instinct would kick in at the point of death and those men would have recanted? And said, so, you know what, I was just making this up about Jesus. I thought it was a really cool story to think about a guy that can perform miracles. But I was making it all up. I don't want to die. Take me down off of the burning stake and let me live. But none of them did. All of them died for the sake of their belief in the resurrection of Jesus. And they seal their faith in, in his deity with their blood. Um, so... That's one of the big proofs about Jesus, is indeed his miracles. The problem, though, with Jefferson's view is that um, he didn't believe in the supernatural, and so he already entered into his examination of Jesus with his presuppositions and biases. But the problem is, the authoritative teaching of Jesus is verified by the miraculous. I mean, why should you think that he's moral? Why should you listen to his ethics? Why should you listen to anything that he taught I'll tell you why. Because of his miracles. Because they prove who he was. And that's what Nicodemus says to Jesus. Nicodemus, when he meets with Jesus, before Jesus was ever even resurrected, Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 2 says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Why? Because you teach such good morals. No, we know that you're a teacher come from God because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. By the way, what happens in John chapter 2? He turns water into wine. He performs a miracle. And then Nicodemus is like, there's something different about this guy. And so he wants to know more from Jesus about his miracles. This is stated all over the, the scriptures. John 5 verse 36. It says the testimony, this is Jesus speaking, the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. Okay, he's trying to prove who he is. He says, yeah, John said that I was the coming one and I was the son of God. But he said, I've got something even better than that. What's that? The works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me. The miracles say something about who I am, is what he's saying. They say that the Father has sent me, that I'm from God. So Jesus was more than just a philosopher and more than just a good man. From conception to resurrection, the life of Jesus is filled with miraculous proof of his identity. And that's why the miraculous is there. It's proof. His birth is born of a virgin. That's proof that God came into the world in a very unique way. He wasn't born naturally the way most of us are. He was born of a virgin. We see his life is evidence of his miraculous ability. Luke chapter 7 and verse 22. This is a verse where again Jesus is verifying who he is. Here he says, tell John, we mentioned this in our very first lesson of this series, when John was doubting, are you the coming one? Are you sure that you're the Christ? Jesus says, go tell John the things that you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Every one of those, except those last one, every one of those things except the last one are miraculous events. They are intended to prove who Jesus was um, by his miracles. He had undeniable physical healings. We have the man who was born blind in John 9. We have the man who was sitting by the pool of Bethesda who had been lame for years in John 5. People couldn't deny that those were real miracles. They knew the guy had been blind for his whole life. And so they were impressed with the ability of Jesus. 
We have supernatural miracles with eyewitnesses like the turning of water into wine in John chapter 2. And we also have the raising of the dead in passages like Matthew 9 and Luke in John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus, the, wi- the raising of the widow's son at Nain. Um, and then we have, of course, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which was his miracle that makes him far more unique than miracle workers like Elijah or Elisha in the Old Testament. None of them were raised from the dead. Makes him different. These miracles, the point of them, is they're God's way of testifying that Jesus was far more than a philosopher. He's not to be put on the level of Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and, and other just great you know, academic philosophers. There's something different about Jesus. And that's what Peter preaches in Acts 2. He says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested by to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs which God performed through him in your midst. He goes on to say more about Jesus, but he uses the miracles, wonders, and signs as proof as to who Jesus was. So, based upon the testimony about Jesus, can we say that he was a good philosopher, just a good man? No, because his miracles proved that he was more than that. I think we can dispose of the fourth one fairly easily in this audience. Was Jesus an evil person? Now here's why people say Jesus was an evil person. I'll give you a quote that I used earlier in the week from Bertrand Russell, who once wrote in Why I Am Not a Christian. He said, there is one very serious defect to my mind in Christ's moral character, and that is that he believed in hell. I do not myself feel that any person who is really profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. And he thought that was evil. From his perspective, that was evil for Jesus to believe in hell. And there are atheists who believe that Jesus was evil because he taught about judgment and because he taught about hell. However, one of the things that we need to consider about those who knew Jesus and were closest to him is that they never considered him an evil sinner by the testimony of Scripture. Um, Jesus, in fact, once asked to people who were picking up stones, one to stone, because he claimed to be God, he asked the question, which of you convicts me of sin? And no one could find an accusation. They couldn't find anything sinful about Jesus that they had the right to really throw those stones. And the disciples of Jesus, over and over again, when you read through the Gospels, they declare his sinlessness. Never claim that he's a sinner. In fact, there's something very unique about Jesus compared to any other human who has ever lived, and that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but Jesus never sinned, which is why he could be our perfect sacrifice on the cross. And he's declared as such multiple times. First Peter chapter 1, uh, let's take a look at him, and even, even his enemies speak of his flawless character. Look at all these quotes. First Peter chapter um, chapter 2 says, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps who committed no sin. That's Peter. What does Peter think about Jesus? He was evil? No, he committed no sin. There was no deceit found in his mouth. Jesus was never dishonest about anything. You could ever catch him in a lie. So he didn't lie. First John chapter 3 and verse 5, John says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. John says the same thing. There's no sin. It's not evil. There's no sin. We couldn't find anything on him. Hebrews says this. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, as we are, yet without sin. Something different about the high priesthood of Jesus. All the other priests had been sinners in the past. They needed to offer sacrifices for the people and also for themselves. But Jesus didn't have to offer a sacrifice for himself, just for others, because he himself could be the sacrifice because he was without fault, without blemish. Matthew 27, even Judas gives back the money that he was given after he betrayed Jesus and says, I have sinned. By betraying innocent blood, he feels guilty for selling out someone that he knew was of high moral character, innocent, as he states it. In Luke 23, Pilate, sitting there with Jesus in front of him, and he says, why are we putting this guy to death? What's going on? Because I have 
found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. And remember, he goes, he takes his hands, and he washes them symbolically because he says, I don't want his blood on my hands, but if that's what you guys want to do, go ahead. But he says, I have found in him no guilt. So here's a Roman, not even a follower of Jesus, who says the same thing. I don't think this guy is evil. I don't understand why we're on trial here. Jesus was not an evil person. Now, some claim that he was evil because he talks about hell. Some claim that he was evil because he would condemn sinners, and they say that that's immoral. And I want you to think about that for just a moment. Is it moral to allow injustice and rebellion without punishment? In our moral argument lesson from Sunday night, we made this point that we actually want people to be morally accountable. We expect the child molester to be put in prison. We want a rapist to be locked up. We think murderers need to be punished and so that other people can be protected and so that justice can be served. So what is, what, what is Jesus supposed to say or what is Jesus supposed to do about injustice and rebellion and evil? He's just supposed to allow it to go on? No, he says something about it because he wants people to change. This doesn't make him evil. This is part of his justice. This is part of his fairness. Further, while Jesus condemns sin, it was never his ultimate goal to see sinners condemned. And we need to keep that in mind. He actually comes to warn sinners so they might be saved. Not because he wants them to be lost. Not because he gets some joy or thrill out of telling people the consequences of sin he wants them to rescue themselves it's like this you go to the doctor and the doctor says to you look you know look josh you've been preaching too many meetings and eating too many meals you're getting overweight which you probably could say to me and i think you need to go on a diet and lose some weight or you're going to have a heart attack and you're going to drop dead okay I hope that doesn't happen because this would be terrible that I just preached this right here. But, <laughs> but what do I say to the doctor? You know what, doctor? I'm done with you. I think you're evil because what kind of a person would try to tell me that I'm doing something wrong? The doctor is not doing that out of any evil motive for me. The doctor is doing that because the doctor wants to save me from some of my own problems that are leading to bad health. Yeah. Uh, same is true when, when you've got your kids, you know, they're in school and they come home and they've got an F on their report card or on their test. What do you do? You call the teachers? How dare you do that to my kids? I think you're evil. Do you know how that made them feel that they got an F? And there's parents that do that, by the way, but you shouldn't because there's a good chance that you got an F because you didn't study and you didn't do the work. And you need to be held accountable for that. It doesn't make you evil for holding people accountable. You know, that's how we reason sometimes with Jesus. Um, what we really need to consider about Jesus is if there is a heaven and a hell, and if there is wrath to come for those who sin and don't repent, then isn't it kind of Jesus and gracious of Jesus and merciful of Jesus to have come to earth to warn us so that we might be saved from the wrath to come. We're looking at Jesus in the wrong way. I don't think Jesus is evil. He was never portrayed as evil, although some people want to portray him that way today. Um, <clears throat> John 3.17 says, God didn't send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God wants to save us. And so, no, I don't think we can say Jesus is an evil person. I've got just one more, and that is the idea that Jesus somehow manipulated prophecy. Jesus was, was trying to act out prophecy to fulfill all those Old Testament prophecies that are about him. There's a simple way to disprove that, and it's this. Okay, how did he manipulate the place of his birth? He was inside of his mother. How do you manipulate being born in Bethlehem? How do you manipulate the manner of his birth? How do you manipulate being betrayed by a friend? Judas, I want you to come with a bunch of people with clubs and swords and give me a kiss on the cheek because the book of Zechariah says that that's what's supposed to happen. 
book of Psalms says that my friend is going to kiss me on the cheek. And so we need to make sure that we play this out. We really sell it because we want people to believe that I am the Messiah. How do you act out the reaction of the crowd? You know, the, Psalm 22 is very vivid portrayal of Jesus on the cross. I mean, you're on the cross and you're saying, hey, at this point in time, it's good for you guys to sneer. I'd like for you to make fun of me because we need to make sure that we're fulfilling prophecy. Jesus doesn't engineer those things. How do you engineer being pierced with a sword? Prophecy said he was dead already. He couldn't have told him, by the way, after I die, take a sword, stab me, because we need to make sure that we get down to Zechariah chapter 12, and verse 10 prophecy. He doesn't engineer prophecy. He doesn't engineer his burial place. He doesn't engineer his resurrection, okay? Jesus didn't manipulate prophecy. This argument, which is kind of a rare argument, really, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it makes Peter this community player. It makes Judas a thespian. It makes Jesus an Oscar Award winner. Like they were deliberately deceiving people so that they could dupe the world into believing that he was the Christ. That's just too far-fetched to believe. There's 300 Old Testament references and prophecies that are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The possibility of that being just coincidental um, and not real, well, Peter Stoner writes an interesting book where he says, the chance that any man might have lived down to the present time and fulfilled all eight prophecies, he just takes eight in this calculation. He says, for one man just to have fulfilled eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. That would be one in, and that's the number right there. I don't even know what that number is. But suppose we take 10 to the 17th silver dollars. We lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover all of the state two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars, stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state, blindfold a man, tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he has to pick up one silver dollar and say that this is the right one. What chance would he have of getting the right one? He goes on to say, just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man from their day to the present time, providing they wrote them according to their own wisdom. Statistically and mathematically, you, the, the, the odds are terrible that Jesus could have just coincidentally fulfilled these prophecies or manipulated them. That's not a possibility either. So what is the possibility? What is it that maybe we should consider? Well, I would argue with you, we should consider what the Bible originally says. That he's the son of God. Jesus is not a legend. He is a verifiable historical character. A real human being who lived. And he claimed, and others testified, that he was more than a prophet. As a real historical character, he never said, I'm just a prophet. He claimed to be more than that. His miracles prove that he was more than just a philosopher. So we can't say he was just a good man. He was just had really good teaching. His miracles prove that he's different than just philosophers and academics. His sinless life and his teachings prove his true character. We've known a lot of people in history who were good philosophers, who were good speakers, and they lived sinful lives. And sometimes the skeletons that were in their closet came out. There are no skeletons in Jesus' closet. He lived a sinless life. And it proves his true character, as all who knew him claimed. And he fulfilled the prophecies, proving his identity as the Messiah. All those prophecies were about him, and they're there as evidence so that we might believe that he was the son of God and ultimately the ultimate miracle of Jesus is that Jesus went to the cross he died and three days later he rose from the dead to prove that he was indeed the son of God Jesus is the virgin born miracle working risen conqueror he is the king of kings and that's why when he appears to Thomas who was doubting and struggling in his faith to believe that one that he'd saw die could possibly be risen and Thomas finally had the opportunity to put his finger into the prints of the nails and to put his hand near Jesus side Jesus said to him Thomas because you have seen me you have believed but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed Thomas said my Lord and my God 
And even though we don't have the opportunity to examine Jesus in person, we have the opportunity to examine all the eyewitnesses who were close to Jesus so that we might believe just as Thomas did. And so I ask you, if you haven't made a decision about Jesus yet, what do you believe about Jesus? I think we've ruled out some things. He was real. He was sinless. He performed miracles. He fulfilled prophecy. He was raised, risen from the dead. So what do you believe about Jesus who is called the Christ? I know you hear a lot of things from people out there in the world, but I think very quickly here we've tried to dispose of a lot of those ideas and point out that they're, first of all, just not even true and they're, some of them illogical and irrational when we consider the true Jesus of history. So what do you believe? You know, the last time that I was here in Worcester a couple of years ago, I, I preached a lot of sermons from the Gospels, and I, and I think I was trying to appeal to your emotions. I was trying to appeal to your will. I was trying to encourage you to take action in your life. But this week, I've tried to preach lessons to let you know that your mind can believe what the Bible reveals about God. And the reason why I've tried to appeal to your mind and to your intellect is because the scriptures say the first and great command is this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want you to understand that we can intellectually believe in who Jesus claims to be and in who other people preached that he was. There is good reason why millions of believers for two millennia, they have placed their faith in Jesus. And I would just ask you, if you haven't been counted among their number, why don't you make that decision tonight? It's a simple confession that you have to make. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The ten most important words that you'll ever say. And if you're ready to make that confession, you'd also be willing to live according to the will of Jesus. Turn from your sins. Be baptized into him. That's how we get into the family of Jesus. And then live your life according to his will. All the way into eternity. If you're ready to do that, why don't you do it tonight? We'd be glad to baptize you into Jesus Christ this evening. There'd be no better way to end this week than to end it like that. And so we would invite you to do that while we stand, while we sing.